you have a Bible, please turn with me to the book of John, John chapter 18, and uh, we'll get started here in verse 33 in just a moment. But uh, as we begin, you know, I don't need to tell you that it's been a long two weeks or a long year, kind of depending upon how you quantify that. And then, of course, um, as I'm sure you guys are all well aware, we have an election coming on Tuesday, and uh, I assume most of you have probably already voted. So the uncertainty, perhaps, is not so much who you're going to vote for as to what the outcome is going to be. And uh, so there's all sorts of uncertainty and angst in our culture, in our world, in our hearts, in our community, in our lives. And so just one more reason, I think it's, uh, you know, helpful right now that we're meditating on this sermon series of the kingdom of God. And uh, so there's a handful of verses we'll look through this morning. We're going to bounce around a bit. But I want to start here in John chapter 18 with uh, this encounter that Jesus has with Pontius Pilate as he is facing crucifixion and execution at the end of his three years of earthly ministry. And uh, so please join me in reading John chapter 18, beginning in verse 33. So Pilate entered into his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say this to you about me? And Pilate answered and said, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What what have you done? And Jesus answered and said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I would not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews, and he told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release to you one man Uh, at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, not this man, but give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. The word can mean insurrectionist. Let me just keep reading here, get the whole context. Then Pilate took Jesus and he flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on his head and they arrayed him with a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Now Pilate went out again, and he said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. And when the chief priests and the officers saw him, They cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves, and you crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. And the Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered into his headquarters again, and he said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you 
the Jewish leaders, they have the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are no friend of Rome's king, Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in an Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold, your king. And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to be crucified. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the light of your word this morning as we read here and elsewhere from Holy Scripture. And I pray as we do, both in the reading and in the hearing and in the consideration of these things, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts and our minds. I pray that you would reveal Jesus Christ to us all the more that you would give us a sense of our loyalties and allegiances in this world, and that you would strengthen us to be your people in this world as long as you leave us here. And we pray again that you would soon take us home. So Lord, we love you, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is the story, just in summary, kind of this sec section, this segment of Jesus' road to crucifixion. This is kind of how it played out in the final moments before he got his sentence, where he was brought by the Jewish authorities to the Roman authorities, who, of course, Rome had conquered the land of Israel a uh, hundred years or more before. And uh, Rome itself, indeed, as we'll talk about in a bit, Rome had been established some 600 years prior, and uh, the city of Rome was just expanding in its influence and power. By the end of the Roman Empire, it had literally been there for a thousand years, in this thousand-year reign of the Roman Empire. And so they were, so Caesar, the, the king of Rome, was indeed viewed as the king of kings. He was viewed as the king of, of everywhere that their influence went. And uh, Rome faced no rivals. But the Jewish authorities here had delivered Jesus to the Roman authorities because he was challenging, in their minds, in their accusation, he was challenging the, uh, the king of Rome. And so Pilate finds himself in kind of a sticky situation because he recognizes that Jesus Christ is innocent of any sort of capital offense, and he is, as such, in a variety of ways, defending him against those claims. This man is not guilty of a capital offense. I find no fault in him. That's what the pagan Roman governor testified about Jesus. But what, what surfaces here in this conversation, especially in verse 33 and following to the end of chapter 18, is this conversation about the nature of Jesus as king. That's the accusation. And he asks him, are you, a, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, do you ask this of your own accord, or did others say this about, about me? And Pilate's claim is, am I a Jew? Like, am I concerned about these things? My question is, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus, he doesn't exactly answer it. He doesn't give a pot. He doesn't exactly say one word. But the way he answers is uh, he didn't say yes or no, I am a king or I'm not. He answers more broadly. And I think in a way that reflects the nature of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. So yes, I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were, indeed my servants would fight, they would be fighting so that I would not be delivered up. But my kingdom is not from this world. 
and their conversation continues. So there's a handful of things we can garner here. And the first one is that very clearly, Jesus, in his own mind, in his own understanding of who he is and what he's about, is Jesus Christ is for sure a king. He references his kingdom. But it's interesting to me, the specific question that Pilate, the Roman governor, is asking is, are you the king of the Jews? And I think there's a way in which Jesus would say yes, and there's a way in which Jesus would say no. Because basically what Jesus, I think, says here is, I think he would say, Pilate, I'm not just the king of the Jews. I'm the king of the entire Roman Empire in all the unknown world that lies before you. I'm Caesar's king. I'm your king. And certainly, yes, I'm also the king of the Jews. And so, anyway, he says here, my kingdom is not of this world. And, and so what does he mean here? He says it's not of this world or else my followers would fight to defend it. They would fight to defend me. They would fight to enact it. And then again, my kingdom is not from this world. So my kingdom is not of this world and my kingdom is not from this world. And what I take him to be saying here is this. Uh, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, it, is not, it does not have its origins in this world. It does not originate here. And uh, indeed, the seat of power, if you would, in the kingdom of Jesus Christ is an eternal throne. It is high above all other governments and authorities. It comes from God himself. So it's not from this world. It is from, it is from God in its origin. And then also it says it's not of this world. And, and it's not that it doesn't have implications or ramifications for this world. It very much does, as we see here and as we see play out in our conversations about the kingdom of God. But I think the primary point is it's not an earthly political movement, that the kingdom of God is not restricted or limited to sort of just political activity or sort of human rule, like, like Jesus has come to, Jesus has not come to just set up a capital that's going to control the world, which of course is what the Jewish conception of the Messiah would be, but indeed that from his throne in heaven he would rule and reign over heaven and earth and all kings would bow the knee to him. So it's not a political, uh, earthly rule that he's setting up, although it has political and earthly consequence for everyone that lives in our world. There are manifestations of it here in this world. And so this is where we've been talking about the idea of the kingdom of God as both now and not yet. Or the kingdom of God as already and not yet. There's a way in which Jesus has, has ushered in the kingdom of God. In his ministry, he said, repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom has come into the world, although we realize and recognize that the final consummation of that has not yet fully manifested. So, so these are some of the ideas that we've been discussing and considering, and I think we see them reflected in the words of Jesus. We fast forward a bit here, and the very next thing is Jesus is uh, not only beaten and flogged and ridiculed, but he's crucified, and he, and he ultimately dies. He's buried, and then as we know, he is resurrected gloriously over death hill in the grave. He, he comes roaring back to life, never to die again. And then, in, and then he spends more than a month revealing himself to his disciples and to other people. He said the Bible says he was seen by more than 500 people even at once. And so we have no idea really how many people Jesus encountered or revealed himself to as he was resurrected, bodily resurrected. And people saw him and, and they thought and they began to think, okay, now, now the kingdom is about to come. Jesus is about to set up his kingdom now. And what do we see in the book of Acts, chapter 1, as he is just about to ascend back up into heaven? In verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, it says, When they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Because it's still all they can really comprehend or think about is, 
that the son of David was going to come and reestablish the kingdom of Israel. And I think he just shakes his head and he says to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority for all of that. But this is for you to know. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up into the heavens and was taken and hidden by the clouds as he ascended back to his throne, to his coronation in, in heaven. And so, you know, the story goes on, and the disciples are standing there scratching their heads, kind of wondering what to make of all of that. And then, as we know, the rest of the story plays out. They go to Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit falls upon them, and they begin to go out into the world and represent the kingdom of God by preaching the gospel everywhere that they go. Fast forward even further, what happens is throughout the Roman Empire, beginning with the Apostle Paul and many other Christians as the gospel is going forward into all the various corners of the Roman Empire. And if you read the history of the early church, what happens in the first 300 years, excuse me, in the first 300 years of the Roman Empire is they, the Christians face one form of torturous, severe persecution after the next. And yet the church continues to grow. And then they're persecuted and pursued and thrown in jail and thrown to the lions. And the church continues to expand and grow. Pure, entirely in spite of the, the govern, governing authorities and the political rule. And then something amazing happened 300 years later. What happened? You likely know. The emperor became a Christian. And all the Christians begin to think what? The kingdom of God has come. Right? The kingdom of God is now being established among men because, I mean, the emperor of the, of the thousand-year reign has now become a Christian, and Rome is going to begin to Christianize the world. And as the story goes on, we know that uh, this idea became palpable, this idea that the kingdom of God and the church and even the state were perhaps sort of a manif the manifestation of the kingdom of God on earth. So a hundred years later, when vandals and barbarians from the north invaded the city of Rome for the first time in a thousand years and raped and pillaged their way through the city of Rome and conquered it, pagans and Christians alike were completely shocked and baffled and did not know what to make of it. For the Christians, there was, they had begun to tie themselves to this notion that Christianity was going to politically rule and reign the world from this place, this seat in Rome. And it began to, that just evaporated in a day. And so this question was palpable. What about the gospel? What about Christianity? Its plausibility and its power came into question across the Roman Empire. And Christians found themselves once again trying to defend the gospel in a pagan context with a whole lot of questions. And it, it was in this setting that uh, the early church father, Augustine, was across the Mediterranean in North Africa. And he began to write what became one of his most famous books called The City of God. And in this, Augustine captured the biblical teaching of the nature of the city of God versus the city of man. Later, and especially in the Reformation, like Martin Luther, John Calvin, would sort of shift the language into the king, the two kingdoms, not just cities, but of course in the ancient world, the city-state of Rome was so dominant that the city was uh, a kingdom more or less in itself. <clears throat> Pardon. But as we regain sort of this idea in the church, of these two cities or these two kingdoms. This is where we get to this notion that I want to talk about this morning is the nature of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man, the city of God, the city of man, and the ways in which these relate and intersect, the ways in which we live in both if we are Christians. 
And uh, so, so on the one hand, we see that there's the earthly city, and, and Augustine talked about this, and, uh, or the earthly kingdom. And this is made up of all people, of every, of every you know, belief and background, who, whoever they are. All people make up the earthly city, the earthly kingdom. And yet, there is another kingdom, and it's the spiritual kingdom of Christ that's ruling and reigning, especially only in the hearts of those that have trusted in Christ, that have been born again. And this is where we see there's this tension, because these two kingdoms, these two cities, are at present in conflict. And we feel the tension as we live our lives. If you're a Christian, if you're trusting in Christ and God is at work in and through you, you feel the tension of these two worlds. There's a clash between the kingdom of God and a clash between the kingdom of man or the city of God or the city of man. Even as why we, we talked about two weeks ago, that's why the Lord taught us to pray that God's kingdom would come, his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's a clash between those two. The will of God's not always done on earth, right? Every time we sin or rebel against God and we go our own way, the will of God's not being done. Now, we, we realize God is sovereign and providentially he's somehow able to weave our rebellion into his long-term plan of what he's doing. He's certainly able and not confounded by our rebellion, but he weaves it together for his own purposes. But it doesn't mean we don't kick and scream and get drugged along as a world. And so this is the clash of kingdoms of the kingdom of God and of the kingdom of man. Now, there's something about kind of the nature of cities and the nature of kingdoms that is, uh, in, our, in our world, this is just an observation I wanted to make. You know, as we think about uh, the city of Rome, or we can think of all the various great cities and kingdoms, uh, especially the ones over the years who have uh, wrestle with that, this idea of perhaps being kind of the seat of the kingdom of God. We take Jerusalem, obviously, as a biblical example, or, or Rome, as we've been talking about. You can look at the Holy Roman Empire, or Germany and the Reformation, or Geneva, or you think about the, uh, the United Kingdom. There was a time, a hundred and some odd years ago, when the sun never set on the land of England, okay, and it's, and it's rule and reign, and my how things have changed. It's now a little island again. But, uh, or we could even talk about the United States of America. And, and the reality is that these cities, these nations, these states, as they, as they dominate the global geopolitical landscape, the, the reality is what there becomes a sense of inevitability, like, like this will never change, this will never go away. And, and it's the center of history, it's the center of everything. But the reality is that what the Bible teaches is that nations do what? They, nations rise and nations fall. You know, kingdoms come and kingdoms go. Kings rise and fall. Kings come and go. And, and the story of the Bible and the story of the kingdom of God is that Jesus is the king of kings. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of all other lower kingdoms. And, and so the reality is God certainly elevates nations at times. And then he also humbles them and brings judgment. God elevates rulers and he holds them accountable. And so this is to talk to some extent about the two kingdoms, the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of the world. So as Christians, we find ourselves living in the kingdom of men. That's very much where we live. We live in the earthly kingdom. And, and sometimes I think we wrestle with what does that look like? How do we interact with the world around us? We still live here. We, we sometimes wish, you know, that that when we trust in Christ, he'd just sort of take us out of the world and it'd be a lot easier. You know, why, Lord, why do you leave us here? And the answer comes back, I have a purpose for you. You're here, as long as you're, you're here, excuse me, as long as you're here, it's because God has a purpose for you to, to serve him in this world. And uh, it's not to torture us, it's not to cause despair or to distress us by all the calamities of the world, but it is to use us in the world, and we know that he has a purpose because we're still here. Um, so some of the ways that we can conceive of this, like let me start here in the book of Philippians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul describes Christians this way 
in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Well, starting in verse 19, Paul's talking about the non-Christian world. He says their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and, the, and they, they glory in their shame with mindset, with mindset on earthly things. But different than that, contrary to uh, those who are simply a part of the earthly king, the kingdom of this earth and world, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, my love and long for my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. So Paul says this as he is in writing to the church in Philippi. And just a little background on the church in Philippi. Philippi was a Roman colony. Indeed, it was sort of like a retirement spot for uh, Roman uh, governing, you know, maybe military authorities. And, and nonetheless, so that to be a Roman citizen, in Rome in general was huge, but to be a Roman citizen in the city of Philippi was super important. And so Paul appeals to this, and he says, as Christians, no matter what else is true about our citizenship or our social identity, all those things matter to us. But the thing that matters the most is where our ultimate citizenship is. And, and Paul says, our citizenship is in heaven. <clears throat> and from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his. Well, so, okay, take Paul, for example. I think Paul would... In this example, of course, he, we're quoting Paul. Paul, so Paul clearly, was a Jewish man. In his description, he says, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees, of the tribe of Benjamin. I mean, his Jewish credentials are massive. You know, and he presents that before he says they don't matter to him in the scheme of things. God doesn't relate to him on his glorious pedigree. Uh, there's something else at play. And so, so Paul is clearly a Jewish uh, ethnically Jewish man, and then also very much a citizen of the Jewish people. But further, one of the things we see about Paul is he is a citizen of Rome. Whatever his, uh, the story goes for Paul, he is someone in his family, and his, one of his father, grandfather, someone had earned Roman citizenship. And so Paul was born into the Roman Empire as a citizen. So when they're preparing to beat him for preaching the gospel, all he has to do is pull out his trump card and say, hey, by the way, I'm a Roman citizen. And they all go, oh my gosh, we can't beat Roman citizens. We can only beat other people. And, um, and so Paul uses his Roman citizenship. He, he leaned into it from time to time. But what Paul primarily says here is the thing that is most essential and consequential for him is that his citizenship is in heaven. And I think what that means for us is whatever our various backgrounds are, they matter to us. They, they are who we are. They, they reflect where we live and what, how we got to where we are, whether we're Euro-American or Afro-American or uh, Asian-American or all the various uh, accumulations of that or whatever it is, our sort of ethnic background and identity, or our cultural life. We even have a Canadian in the room. And, uh, and so the reality is, whatever the accumulation of our earthly citizenships and ethnicities and backgrounds, all those streams actually are important. We, we live in that world, but they are not our first allegiance. Our first allegiance is that our citizenship is in heaven. Now, we don't here have flags on the stage. I'm not really opposed to that. But we, you know, a lot of churches will have an American flag and a Christian flag and, um, or, or some accumulation of the others. And, and, of course, if you've ever seen the Christian flag, you know, it's not actually the flag of the kingdom of God. But if it were, the reality is, so in America, by law and by custom, the American flag flies where in relation to all of the other flags, right? Yeah, it's on top. I mean, 
And so, except unless you're in the great state of Texas, and, and in Texas they fly side by side, and um, <laughs> which is true. And um, but but it, like in Colorado, the Colorado flag flies below the American flag, the Red Cross, whoever, whatever your flag is, it flies below. But if if the Christian flag were truly the flag of the kingdom of God, it would wave high above the other. And it would only be fitting that we would put it on top. And now the truth is, to my red-blooded American friends, that might be an offensive concept, but the reality is that's an idea that the world needs to come to grips with. Jesus is not simply the king of Christians. Jesus is the king of all kingdoms. He is the king of Caesar. He is the king of the president of the United States. He's praised the king of, of heaven and earth. And uh, so this might be offensive, perhaps, to our American sensibilities or whatever the other flag customs are around the world, but because the reality is we, we certainly know that that idea was offensive to Rome. You know? Rome, uh, in Rome, Caesar was king. Rome was top. And so for the Christians to come along and say, actually... You are a subordinate power who is accountable to another. They have no room. We'll throw you to the lions, right? We'll take you out and beat you, whip you, whip you into shape. And uh, so it's an idea that our world has to begin to come to grips with. And it will one day fully come to grips with that Jesus is the King of Kings. Jesus is the Lord of Lords. We've read some from the book of Daniel. So I want to read just one sentence from uh, the conversation surrounding King Nebuchadnezzar's second dream. So this is the, at the time, you know, hundreds of years before Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, was the king of kings. Of all the, you know, he was the Rome of the day. He was Caesar of the day. And, and mysteriously, God is giving this king dreams. One day he's humbling him. But he's also telling that he's exalted him. Like he has made him the king of the other nations. And he's also deeply accountable to God. And so there's this mysterious interaction where God is revealing himself to this pagan king. And, uh, but one of the things that, one of the points of what he's doing is captured here in this verse. In Daniel chapter 4 verse 17. Just halfway through, I'll just pick up. He says, um, these things are so, the things God was revealing in his dream about the, the humiliation of the nations and, and God's uh, authority over all the, even the kingdoms and the power of Babylon. says that the living, those that live on earth, in the earthly kingdom, that the living may know that the Most High rules over the kingdom of men. And he gives it to whomever he will. And he sets over it even the lowliest of men. So the, the Most High, the Most High God rules over the kingdom of men and he gives it to whomever he will for whatever his inscrutable reasons are, even to the lowliest of men, even to a man like Nebuchadnezzar. So we see here that, that the kingdom of God again rules over the kingdoms of men. And, and he uses as the leaders of those nations even the lowliest. Your translation may say the basest of men. And, and these things all, I think, beg the question of how do we live in relation to the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God? How do we interact with these things as Christians? How do we relate to the subordinate rule of earthly kingdoms and uh, still very much be a part of the kingdom of God. Our primary citizenship is there. So the three main things, and I'll just go through these quickly. Uh, we've been talking about the first one, but the three main kind of ways in which I think we should conceive of ourselves as Christians in the world is citizens of the kingdom of God, exiles from the kingdom of God, living in another nation, and ambassadors of the kingdom of God. If you've ever traveled or been out of the country, or perhaps you've heard this phrase, you know, everyone that is not from there are referred to as expatriates or expats. 
And what that means is they are uh, foreign nationals living in a place not their home. And uh, so there's this idea of, of your, your identity, your allegiance, everything is, is your homeland, but you live, you live somewhere else. And the biblical word for this is exile. And, and now we, like, an exile can be a political exile, like you get cast out of your country because we don't like your politics. But in the biblical conception of an exile, it, it, it's grounded in the Babylonian uh, domination of the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. So what happened was the city of Jerusalem refused to let God ultimately be their king. And so the Lord removed them from the land. He said, I'm going to send another nation to conquer you and remove you into exile. And uh, by the promise of God, he would one day take them back. But what we know is the Babylonians came in and they conquered and destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the vast majority of the Jewish people were hauled into captivity in Babylon. Some earlier captivities from the Assyrians. So the, we see the Jewish people scattered throughout the surrounding nations. And that's what biblically is referred to as the exile. And so they maintained their identity as the Jewish people, but they had to live in a foreign context. And, and they lived with the hope, the promise God had made them, of their ultimate return to the land of Israel and to the city of Jerusalem. And so they waited and they lived in the expectations of the fullness of that promise. So they were exiles in that regard. So there's exiles. And then, of course, this word ambassador, and this is where I want to start, is what is an ambassador? What is an ambassador? An ambassador is an official, a designated official who is anointed and appointed to be a diplomatic, authoritative representative of a foreign kingdom. And they typically live in a foreign nation as a sort of outpost to the nation that has sent them. I mean, so like, you know, historically, at least in America, we've always talked, you know, if a, if a, if an embassy were attacked, it's like America being attacked because it's, it, it is a sovereign representation of our nation. And so that's why it's taken that way. Or if an, if an ambassador is attacked, it's taken as though that is, um, that is a, a, an attack upon the nation itself. So this language comes uh, from two main places in 2 Corinthians. I told you we were going to bounce around today. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 here, quoting the Apostle Paul again. Paul is, uh, so beginning verse 17, he's been talking, he says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Okay, the old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God. For Christ has reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their sins against them and entrusting to us a message, the message of that reconciliation. Verse 20, therefore, Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent the, the interests of the kingdom of God. We represent the message of the king of the kingdom of God. And therefore, he says, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you then, on behalf of God, to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him, that is Jesus Christ, to be sin, who, uh, who knew no sin. Even Pilate said he has no, finds no fault in him. He had no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. And so Paul says, the result of what God has done through Christ is a, is a project to reconcile the fallen city of man, the fallen kingdom of man, this world. He's beginning to reconcile it to himself one life at a time. And to the extent that you have received that reconciliation through Jesus Christ, you're now also commissioned as an ambassador to the world to represent the king of kings and to represent that message of reconciliation to the world. That's a high, high calling that we see here in Paul's talk of us being ambassadors. Secondly, again, Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 to 20, Paul says this. He's asking for prayer for himself. He says, pray also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly 
so that I would proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So Paul's asking for prayer. He's calling this image to mind. He says, I'm an ambassador for Christ, just like I've said we all are, but he's currently in a Roman prison, and he says that has no effect on the commission that I've received. So what I take this to mean as I square these verses together is your situation, in your circumstances, your platform or the voice that you think you have or do not have, whether you are at home and free or whether you are in a foreign prison, it has no effect on your commission as an ambassador for Jesus Christ. In fact, I think Paul took great delight when he was in chains. Very often they would chain their prisoners to a soldier. He just said, wow, I got a prison ministry here. Everyone in the room has to listen to what I have to say. And so Paul says, and he demonstrates for us, the idea of being an ambassador for Christ, no matter what the circumstances are. So this is, we are citizens of the kingdom. We are ambassadors of the kingdom. We're also exiles of the kingdom of God. We can read from 1 Peter chapter 1, where Paul, uh, where Peter addresses the, the various Christians throughout uh, northern Turkey at the time, and he calls them elect exiles. He's tapping into this idea. They're chosen in Christ, drawn through the gospel of Christ, yet they're exiles in the world, like the, the Jewish people of old who are awaiting the return to their homeland. So, so in this idea, how, how do exiles, how are they called to live in the world? We take our marching orders from Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 4 and 7. This is where the Lord is speaking to uh, his people, and Jeremiah is writing this letter to the Jewish people as they've been hauled into exile. They were tempted to, to believe that, that the best thing they could do was get away from Babylon. They were tempted to retreat or to revolt. You know, it's like we even see in the first century what, what some of the Jewish responses were to the Roman rule and reign is we have on the one hand the Essenes who are part of the, uh, the Dead Sea Scroll community. And what did they do? They retreated from the world. They went and they got in monasteries and thanked God they did because they, they had all these records and, and they were scribes and they recorded and copied texts of scripture and left us a huge trove of copies of the Bible. But their idea was to retreat from the world. And then on the other hand, you had the zealots. who The zealots were revolting. Not revolting as in making you sick, but they were revolting against the kingdom of Rome. And they, were, they would murder and attack and assassinate Romans. And they would try to drive them out. They were like almost like terrorists, if you can imagine, or guerrilla fighters. And uh, so the idea of the main themes that ran through in the first century were retreat or revolt. And Paul and Peter and Jesus would all say it's neither. It's neither. And we get our marching orders from Jeremiah, who says to the people of Israel who find themselves in Babylon, they're living in a foreign nation, and they're like, well, how are we supposed to be the people of God? Do we retreat? Do we revolt? What are we supposed to do? And the word of God to them says this in verses 4 to 7, Thus says the Lord, because God had been clear for 70 years they were going to be there for sure before any of them started going back. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Who sent them there? This is God, right? God sent them into exile? Very clearly, God sent them. Who put you in the world? Who made you who you are and put you in the world you are in right now? Almighty God has put you where you are. And so we can hate that. We can kick at that. We can say, well, I want another story. Or I want somebody else's story. No, no, no. God has given you your story. We are put here. Maybe we don't understand all the, but here's the deal. Here's what we do with that. This is a good example of what we do with that. He says, there in Babylon, to the Jewish people, what do you do? Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. 
Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. And seek the welfare of the city that I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare, thus says the Lord God of Israel. And what's found this word welfare is that you may know the Hebrew word shalom, which is a fairly expansive idea of peace and completeness and wholeness and welfare. And so what does the Lord say through Jeremiah to these exiles in Babylon, in this foreign land, trying to figure out what to do? He says, build and live, plant and harvest and eat, marry and multiply and increase. Do not decrease. Don't retreat. Don't revolt. But seek the shalom of the city in which I have placed you. Okay, so there's a lot of implications, a lot of applications for these things that we can talk about. So let me uh, conclude uh, with, these, with these few things. As we talk about the nature of the kingdom of God, as we are citizens in the kingdom of God, citizens, ambassadors, and exiles, is first and foremost, I think our posture ought to be in the kingdom of man that we find ourselves with certainly a mixed world we live in certainly how do we begin to respond to that number one i think is this we should hope in god and place our trust squarely in him in him alone our our trust and our hope our certainty our shalom it does not pin, depend on this world it needs to be placed squarely upon the unchanging realities of the kingdom of god it needs to be placed squarely upon the eternal rule and reign of Almighty God through Jesus Christ. And, and if it's there, nothing can touch it. You know, if there's a, a depression or a run on the banks and, and a crash in our economy or the nation of the United States of America would to evaporate and go away, it's like that would be terrible and that would be hard. But the reality is at the end of the day, our citizenship is fixed in heaven for all eternity. And that's where our ultimate hope and trust needs to be, is in the King of Kings who is working out his plan in and through us. So that's our identity. It's our, our chief allegiance. It's where we get our marching orders. It's what we orient ourselves to is the kingdom of Almighty God. Because the truth is, this is good news for Americans and Canadians or Koreans or Africans, or whatever nation, or every other country in the world, the good news is whether you are free or in chains, the kingdom of God is your citizenship. And we can place all of our hope and our trust there. And that's the thing that ultimately orients us to how we respond to everything else in the world as it comes to us. So on Tuesday, or whenever we get the results of the election, keep in mind that the king, your citizenship is in the kingdom of God, first and foremost, and whether it goes your way or not, we can celebrate that the king is still on his throne, right? We can celebrate that the king of kings, the lord of lords, the president of presidents, the kingdom that is ruling over all others has not been affected. Amen? Amen? So we can trust in that. We can hope in God no matter what happens. Secondly, as ambassadors, we're called to love our king and to represent him to the world around us. It doesn't matter how politics go. In fact, all these things influence how we handle our politics, even on things like Facebook and other. It's how are we representing Jesus even as much as we represent our politics? I mean, I'm not trying to dissuade you from being politically persuaded, if you, if you only knew, I have deeply held political and economic and social opinions, things that I you know, feel very strongly about. I would encourage you to feel very strongly about these things, have very thought, thoughtful ideas about politics and society and all of that. Like, so I'm not trying to discourage that at all. Like be involved, be, you know, be involved in political events and organizations. Sir, heck, we, I, you know, Go join town council. I would love for you know us to be represented locally at every level of uh, government society. Go vote. You know all of these things. But at the end of the day, 
How we carry ourselves is primarily not as Americans or Canadians or whatever it is that are. Primarily, we're representing the King of Kings, and we need to do everything through that lens as we do. Because we are ambassadors of Christ. Our homes, our businesses, our church, certainly, we're like embassies of the kingdom of God. But this is an outpost of the kingdom of God. And we may think, well, it's just a little, you know, we're just a little embassy. But it doesn't really matter. The size, because the authority comes from somewhere else, right? What we represent is much larger than ourselves. And so we need to take that. We haven't even talked about this sort of the idea of the church militant. Because I was talking about not revolting, per se. But the reality is that the historically refer to the church militant. It's where uh, God is supernaturally on the move to conquer the hearts and minds of men. Right? Not through the sword. You live by the sword. You die by the sword. Not by the sword, but by the sword of the Holy Spirit. And so, in that regard, we're like a forward operating base in, in enemy territories. We need to take these, these things seriously. But as ambassadors, we're called anointed and appointed to represent Jesus Christ in the world. The citizens of the world, uh, we live as good exiles. We put down roots. We seek the shalom and the peace of the city and the people around us. We, we build and fight to protect what is right and good. And we marry and multiply. And, and like I said, we vote, um, even sometimes for the lowliest of men. But here's the reality. Um, do you ever feel this frustration when elections come around? You feel like I have, you know, this one thing. I mean, when you talk about presidential elections, it's once every four years. And then I don't even know how many times do we vote in a 10-year period about all the various things we vote on. I don't know, a handful. And, and so sometimes, you know, when people are trying to motivate us to be politically involved and to vote, you can almost feel a little powerless because you feel like, well, I have one vote and I get to do it once in a while. And then it's sort of assumed into everyone else's, you know, you know, canceling out my vote and, and all the ways we can feel like, does it really matter? Does it really help? Uh, if I vote one way, does it really contribute? And, and so, like I said, uh, I would encourage you, if you're discouraged in the process, to, it's a social responsibility if you're able to, to vote, to be actively politically involved. But the reality is this, uh, we only get to vote once for president or once here and there for different things. But the thing we get to do every single moment of every single day is we get to serve the King of Kings as an ambassador to the people around us. We can do that every day, right? Okay, and so that is, if, if the uh, the voting thing seems difficult, then, uh, you know, then emphasize or let the other dominate your thinking as far as priority, because we do that every day, right? We represent the King of Kings every day. Now, in our voting, I would encourage you to vote for the rule of law, vote for, you know, the sanctity of life and biblical marriage and religious liberty, uh, this is the idea of separation of church and state. Why does that matter? Because the reason separation of church and state matters is because the church should be protected from the state. Amen? And we don't need the state telling the church how to run things because the kingdom of God is superior. And um, so anyway, we serve uh, the king of kings and the Lord of lords in our home and in our work, in our leisure, in our rest and in our play and, and in that way sort of like following Jeremiah talking about elect exiles um, who are living out the kingdom of God we create a sort of a subversive force in the world for good that is representing what the kingdom of God will be like as a sampling in our lives for the people around us to encounter the kingdom of God in its manifestations in the world so at the end of the day, though, what we realize and remember is that we serve a king, as we began in John 18, we serve a king who conquered by laying down his life, right? Jesus said, you have no authority to take my life. Later, later on elsewhere, he said, I lay it down with my own accord, and I'm going to take it back up. So Jesus served 
And he led the way by laying down his life. And therefore, that's why he calls us, as we follow him in this world, to take up our cross and to follow him daily. And as he told his disciples in Acts chapter 1, all the questions about when the end of the world is going to happen and the kingdom coming is we would love to see it, we hope for and want to see in our lifetime. The answer is we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to be an ambassador of Christ, representing him to the people around us. He has commissioned us, anointed us, appointed us, and it is a high calling, and you're here for that reason until he takes you home. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.